Can everybody hear? Hands up those who can't hear me. <laughs> As it were. You can, if I come a bit closer, is that better? For those at the back? Those who are using loops or whatever? Great, good. Good evening, everyone. One wet July day, nearly six years ago, we had some spare time between appointments in Essex, so Vicky and I thought of visiting Clare Church just over the Suffolk border. On the way, we drove through Stoke by Clare. I'd been studying the usual documentary sources for music and organs in the late and medieval period for three years, reading inventories, church wardens' accounts, wills, and so on. I remembered reading something about this place, Stoke by Clare, so we stopped to take a look at the church. At first, it seemed a rather dull place. Its nave windows were garish 19th century examples, all yellow diagonal stripes with texts on them. But within a few minutes, we had made two very interesting and totally unexpected discoveries. And that's the beginning of why we are all here this evening. First, on the north side of the sanctuary, about eight feet up from the floor, were three sawn-off ends of what looked like joists. Then we noticed a curious opening to the west of this. That's left on the slide. At first, it looked like a window. And indeed, that's what Pevzler thought it was. But closer examination showed that it had never been glazed and that there were three steps up to it from behind. It was also high enough and wide enough for a person to pass through. Was it perhaps an access, an entry to what might have been a gallery further east? It seemed like it, because its sill was at the same level as those sawn-off stubs. Then Vicky found the vestry key, hidden in a choir pew. Not well enough hidden. Once inside the vestry, we could see the back ends of the two outer joists. They were about five inches by four inches in cross-section, still embedded in the 25-inch thick wall between chancel and vestry, and strong enough to support a considerable weight. Above them was a ceiling with finely moulded oak beams, with a trapdoor in its far corner. On going back outside the church, to look at its east end, we could see that there was indeed an upper room above the vestry. Although we couldn't get up there that day, here was an interesting mystery with two things in this church that may not have been correctly interpreted before. On coming back home, we soon found two early 16th century inventories of the College of Stoke by Clare, which mentioned a standing organ among the three organs in the church. Could this be a reason for the joists we've seen? Had there been a gallery or perk here to support a high up standing organ? We knew that some research had been done in Suffolk, following the rediscovery in the 1980s and 90s of two important organ relics dating from the middle of the 16th century. This included a reinterpretation of socket holes on the north side of the ruined chapel of Walberswick Church on the Suffolk coast. So three months later, on a bright November day, we went there and measured them. We went on to find similar evidence at nearby Covehithe, where we also found what seemed to be an opening to give access to a gallery or perk, just like the one at Stoke by Clare, but much higher up. On the same day, we were able to visit the upper story of a northeast building attached to the chancel of Dennington Church. Here we found what was clearly a hole for the organ's wind trunk, just at the right height to pass directly into the organ's soundboard and pipes, 13 feet and four inches above the floor. This was the first definite evidence we had seen that supported our developing theory. This was, and still is, that later medieval organs were often placed on a perk on the north wall of the sanctuary, with their bellows housed in an upper room or loft behind it, in an attached northeast building. This would be a sensible place to house organ bellows. They can make creaking noises, and they're visually distracting to operate. This idea meant that we could also begin to suggest practical reasons for buildings that are usually dismissed with vague descriptions, such as the priest's room, or the abode of an anchoress. Not usually both. Back in Suffolk a year later, we visited Cran Cratfield Church, well known for its extensive church warden's accounts. Vicky opened the doors leading into the West Tower, and this is what she saw. It is as certainly as it's possible to be at present, half of the perk 
that supported the organ in the sanctuary of that church. Cratfield's accounts mention that an organ was purchased in or by 1497, and that its casework and perhaps front pikes were painted and gilded soon after. Later accounts include a payment in about 1576 of four shillings for taking down the case, and presumably for that respectable sum, moving it elsewhere and setting it up in the church. Doing this freed the North Sanctuary Gallery to be moved to the tower to house the clock mechanism instead, and it saved a long wine climb up the tower to wind it up. The style of construction of the lower parts of the gallery structure fits perfectly into the system of socket holes we'd seen at Warburswick. Its floor joists also go into the wall in the same way that we had seen at Stoke by Clare. So now it seemed clear that there really was evidence in secret places in churches just waiting to be found. This hard physical evidence could bring documents to life, amplify and explain them. It was evidence that also provoked many further questions. We seemed to be looking at things that had not been explained before. And it was about this time in late 2012 that we found out about your society's research award scheme. So we applied for one and received what became the first of three grants at the end of April 2013. And the hard work really began. Our use of the word unsung in the title is, alas, literally as well as figuratively true. The medieval Latin church's music came to an end abruptly and violently in 1548. Since then, there have been more than 450 years for us to forget that there was an intimate connection between the architecture of churches and the music they were designed to shelter. This amnesia is a collective one. On the one hand, few architectural historians write or talk about music. It's even impossible to write whole books about chancels or colleges without actually referring to their chief activities. On the other side, even the best known music historians seem never to consider the practical implications of the music they are discussing. Neither the daily professional lives of its practitioners nor how medieval music's architectural setting evolved. But why did the music stop and become lost to our collective memory? At Christmas 1547, preparations were being made for the forthcoming Book of Common Prayer under the guidance of Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. Among decisions made then was to push a fierce statute through Parliament. This was to order the surrender of Latin service books from every church and cathedral and to have them all delivered to sheriffs and bishops. Huge fines for non-compliance and large payments to informers were key to the success of what must have been a traumatising command. Countless church wardens' accounts include payments for carrying piles of books away from churches to be given up. This operation was carried out from summer 1548 onwards, when these altar and choir books were destroyed by being burnt or cut up into pieces. This terrible holocaust ended 1,500 years of Latin music throughout England and Wales. What was there to destroy? From around the year 1300 onwards, church people had been obliged to provide at least nine Latin books for use in choir and sanctuary. Late medieval inventories show that most churches, colleges and cathedrals possessed many more. In fact, up to 40 such books and volumes seems to be quite common, even in modest churches. So this destruction of mostly handwritten and often illuminated parchment books must have encompassed, we estimate, a total of around 200,000 books. Of this total, music books formed at least two-thirds. A mere handful escaped the conflagration. The best-known music volume which did survive was an illuminated choir book, a presentation copy compiled for Henry VI's new college at Eton around 1490. But this survives to only to less than two-thirds of its original extent, and this is a crying shame, because its surviving index shows that it contained, originally, a nationwide sample of the best of the fully developed polyphonic English music of the late 15th century. It's not boasting, but plain fact, that this music completely outclasses all other European music of the period. We've recently learned there were prototype blast furnaces at Rivo Abbey. If these had been allowed to come into operation in the late 1530s, 
they would have sparked off an industrial revolution 200 years earlier. In just the same way, what would English music, which was already the admiration of continental masters, have achieved if left to develop longer? It's only during the last 15 or 20 years that we've been capable of singing and recording music from the Eton Choir Book. And that shows what a long and deep trough the famous and cherished English chorus tradition has been through for the last 500 years. So English music was not allowed to rise to even greater heights of expertise. And even worse, the mass destruction of its Latin music resulted in any mention of church music being almost entirely missing from later Edwardian, Marian and Elizabethan inventories and accounts. We wonder if this absence and the long subsequent silence have misled scholars into thinking there wasn't any right widespread practice of music in the later medieval church. Such an idea is, however, however, light years away from the truth. Another reason for our collective amnesia is what one might call the long shadow of 19th century misapprehensions. When restoring chancels in English churches, most Victorian churchmen followed continental tridentine models, forgetting that they were dealing with buildings designed for the English Salisbury use and other local rites. In addition, there was a fatal flaw in the chosen Victorian medievalizing model. With continental 16th century counter-reformation policies had come a complete clear out of chancels in favour of the primal status of the altar. Choirs, organs and rood screens were removed. There were so many changes made then that even in an otherwise iconic building such as Shaft Cathedral, the chancel does not remotely represent its medieval state. By contrast, English churches were not affected by these counter-reformation changes. The almost total neglect of chancels for three centuries in the British Isles has meant that evidence can still be found in them, at least where it has not been eradicated by 19th century restoring architects. We have investigated, surveyed, measured and photographed nearly 10% of the surviving English medieval churches during the last six years. What have we found? And what were medieval chances really like? I think the first thing we have to say is that we've been very surprised at just how many signs of their medieval de designed use were waiting to be discovered. But they needed to be searched for. Some signs now seem obvious, but we had just not understood their significance. Other signs were obscured by previous misinterpretations, and one simple instance of this is the absolutely ubiquitous door from outside into the chancel. Everyone knows this as the priests in the singular door but very few have said why it's there or realized who actually did use it. In fact, it was there because this was the access for all who worked in the chancel, and those represented the ordained ministry in all its varying degrees. Here worked boys of age six and upwards who were learning to carry the incense boat and to sing. Here were young candle bearers, adolescent clerks, senior holy water clerks, subdeacons and deacons. Here were all the laymen, professional singers and choir directors. Among the ordained priests here were cantorists or chantry priests and auxiliary stipendiary priests. In charge of all these were the parish's vicar or rector or the college's dean or warden. All these people were there in any numbers that any particular church could manage to support. There were also those who kept the sacristies and the vestries clean and tidy and guarded the, the treasuries. These were all tonsured men and boys, those who were ordained to work in the chancel. After the clerk's entry door, the most common surviving features, though not now visible everywhere, are ceremonial washing places, now called piscinas. They were used at various times during the mass and called lavatories, no doubt because the priest would say silently, lavabo inter innocentes manus meus et circum davo altare tuum. I will go before the altar and wash my hands in innocency. These niche were also used for holding the chalice, brought in by the deacon at the start of the canon of the, mass, uh, of the service, sorry, until it was placed on the altar at the offertorium, the start of the canon of the mass. And this is why there is a shelf in many piscinas, or why the bowl drain is often much smaller than the opening, or why the drain is offset. They are also to be found in sacristies where they've not been turned into mere vestries. Next in frequency of survival or restoration come the fixed seats on the south or epistle side near the altar. These are what the Victorians call sedilia, but they are just referred to as seats in medieval documents. 
and they were used by the various celebrants in the sanctuary during the singing of the epistle, during other lessons or the short homilies given at the sanctuary step. By contrast, choir stalls, as their name implies, were not primarily seats, but places to stand, to sing, often for several hours a day. On an ordinary day, it takes at least two and a half hours to sing the eight offices, with a further three quarters of an hour for an ordinary or, or ferial mass. Each additional lady or requiem mass would take another hour or so. This adds up to around four hours and often more each day. On Sundays and feast days, services are longer and more complex, with sung litanies in processions as well. The daily offices consist of a mix of canticles, hymns and psalms. All of 150 psalms are sung every week. All these were sung by heart, having been learned as a young boy for whom knowledge of the Psalter and basic canticles was a prerequisite for entering the singing choir. Here a six-year-old boy began his career, sitting on a bench or form in front of the higher choir stalls. So he entered education, just like many of us, I imagine, when we started at school all those years ago, in the first form. There's the first form. Between the choir stalls and the sanctuary was a step up into the space across the chancel between the outside clerk's door and the door into the sacristy or vestry on the opposite side of the chancel. Chancel workers gathered in this space, once robed and ready, to process either into the choir stalls or into the sanctuary, depending on their functions. The various openings in the choir stalls allowed for entry into them or for coming out in groups to sing written polyphonic music round a central lectern or for one person to sing a, a lesson in the centre of the choir. Medieval services were not at all static and in smaller churches there were no doubt many and various jobs to be done by the choristas. That's, that's the people who work in the, in the chancel. Not only singing but also for instance ringing bells of various sizes, holding up veils or chasubles or large tall candlesticks at the consecration. And this then is the workplace of the clerks in holy orders, which is still, as we just heard, the official title of a professional priest. Choir stalls are graded. From the lowly first form, there is a step to the second form, and then one more step up again to the stalls of the highest third or senior rank. These upper stalls have hinge seats, which are now called misericords, but the reason for their mo mobility is not only to give them enough room to move into them and stand to sing comfortably in them. One also has to be able to turn eastwards to acknowledge the altar or on entering and leaving the choir to bow in due deference towards the senior clergy standing in the western return stalls. And the same gradation of due and decent order was also designed into the floor levels of the chancel, though this is very often been obscured by 16th century and then 19th century alterations. Starting just west of the choir or root screen doors, there are one or two steps up into the space between the choir stalls. Going eastwards of the stalls, there is another step up to the gathering place between the doors, and then a third step up into the sanctuary. Around the altar, there may be a small further step, the altar pace of wood, stone or brick, with a small carpet over it in front of the altar. And the altar itself was a fairly large and thick slab of fine stone with a profile on its ends and front. Its back was set partly into the east wall of the sanctuary, its front being supported on a high plinth or pillars. And behind the altar were various tables or a single long reed table. Tables were either shallow, carved and painted niche with paintings inside them or were Nottingham alabaster scenes. All these were painted and gilded and fixed to the wall under the east window. When altars were removed and broken up, these tables were destroyed as well, and a whole genus of English art was lost. There were other normal chancel finishings, but some of these are now less easy to see. Many were demolished or deliberately bricked up and plastered over by order of the out-of-control Genevan bishops of Elizabeth's reign. These included the Easter sepulchres, which were used for the burial and resurrection rites of the last three days of Holy Week. And they also seem to have played a part in the Feast of Corpus Christi, celebrated in June, towards the end of the church's ceremonial year. There were also lockable cupboards, called stobs, lined with fine wood. They were used to store the books and handbells that were used every day at the various altars and in the choir. And now we come to the two most important matters that designers of chancels would have been particularly keen to get right. They knew very well what was going to be performed in them so they took care to design their lighting and their acoustics. 
We now t t tend to think of windows as vehicles to stained glass, or so they should be, but only to the extent that they can still function as windows that let in light as well. Many Victorian chancels are so dark with dull hewn glass that it's impossible to read music in them, even in broad daylight, without the lights on, as you see in those pictures. As a result, we have not appreciated the significance of the gradual increase of size of chancel windows as time went on. The da daily variations in the performance of the liturgy were set out in a handbook called the Ordinal. This comprised the psalms, canticles, antiphons, and lessons proper to each day, using a system which became too complex to commit to memory. Ordinals would therefore need to be used by those who stood in the Western choir stalls, and the first larger windows installed in chancels are indeed to be found there. These windows sometimes included low sections, often still with their shutters. They were placed so as to give as much light as possible for the two daybreak officers, matins and lords. And those parts of the mass that varied from day to day made it vital to have good lighting in the sanctuary as well. A late medieval altar was therefore lit not only by the east window, often enlarged for the purpose, but also by new, larger northern and southern ones too. At this time, lecterns in the form of eagles began to appear in churches. The most expensive of these were made from imported brass and were placed in the north part of the sanctuary to support large illuminated gospel volumes. These and their wooden counterparts used for the epistles on the south side also needed lighting from larger side windows so that the deacons and subdeacons could see to sing their respective texts. <coughs> the storers in the 19th century altered the roofs of chancels quite drastically. They removed their ceilings and very often replaced their structures with spindly softwood rafters. But originally they were curved, resonant ceilings, carefully proportioned and lined with wood or plaster and then decorated. Acoustically valuable and ornamental cellulars were also installed over altars and the roof, and these and the ceilings helped singers to perform long and complex services with the relaxed awareness that their job required. During the 14th and 15th century, chancels were very often built as double cubes. We have studied those carefully, but I'm afraid there's no time to discuss that this evening. The later medieval period saw a widening out of chancels to accommodate even more ceremonial at additional side altars, and doing this tended to dull down their acoustic response. But it actually suited the new different style of sung polyphonic music. Clearer acoustics now would help, tend to help singers, because they now needed to hear easily the various musical lines sung by the others. Nor is the time this evening to dis discuss our surveys and studies of choir screens, parklow screens and roodlofts in any detail, or their former platforms and balustrades and the lights that the balustrades carried, or the Golgothas, or the life-size crucifixes that hung from eyes or hooks in the chancel arches. All these would, like so many aspects of our work, require another few lectures, so here are just a few brief observations. We've investigated the internal structures of rood and other screens, and measured mortise holes in their upper beams so that we can reconstruct their missing upper structures. We've also measured their lower entry doors and their lost steps, noting where they start. Those that are wider and easier of access from the east suggest to us some theories over their liturgical use by those who worked in the east, in the chancel and sanctuary. However, to put all transverse screens into the same category as root screens would be to misinterpret them because any an analysis of their practical functions shows that they had many and varied forms. They might be simple division screens with a few oil lights maintained by a nimble person able to negotiate steep steps only 18 inches wide or even less, and a platform only about three feet across. Or they might be large structures with wide excess staircases that supported platforms up to twice that width. One would also need to differentiate clearly parochial root screens with their dooms above them on the west side of a central tower from choir screens placed on the east side of the same tower. An eastern screen might have supported a platform for the collegiate organ if the arch was high enough, or it could have been a place from which singers sang in antiphony with those below. Perhaps this possibility led one or two later 19th century writers to suggest that organs were always on root screens. A host of other authors have since copied this idea without thinking through the practical implications of such a sweeping and therefore misleading statement. 
Developed late medieval polyphonic music required the intensive musical and intellectual training of boys. Their choir presence was often therefore reserved for singing at high altar masses or the masses and vespers of Our Lady performed in her chapels. In school, boys were naturally taught Latin and its concomitant, concomitant grammar and rhetoric, giving them a universal language for any career path they chose to take later on. They also learned to play the organ, the instrument of the composer players who wrote down the best of their improvisations. Two centuries later, later, the sons of Handel, Bach, Haydn and Mozart families and many others were still being taught in much the same way. By the 15th century, many colleges at first just bands of clerks and priests linked by their <coughs> daily liturgical life had become fully fledged teaching institutions. It has been calculated that by the start of the 16th century, there was a free grammar school for every 7,000 of the population, and such schools were to be found everywhere throughout the land. I said just now that priests and clerks in colleges were linked together, and it seems to me that the word college must have originated as something like co-ligere, to attach or link together. Collegiality started in Anglo-Saxon minsters, long before the establishment of the parochial system, its meaning for us, only as a place of higher education, is a much, much later post-medieval idea. And you may think that this linking idea is only a theory, but in fact there are at least two signs of this older meaning still in medieval chancels. First, it's clear that plenty of people were involved in working in them. You only have to see how many seats there are if you count and total up all the choir stalls, the sedilia, and the stone benches around the walls in chancels and side chapels. Second, we have found a, physical, a visible sign of this community in very many churches where it can also be shown that music and liturgy were taken seriously. I am referring to what we have come to call, downgrading I think their real significance, string courses. The significance of these first came into our consciousness with a visit I made to the former collegiate church at Wingham, halfway between Canterbury and Sandwich in Kent. The string course in the chancel here caught my eye because it seemed to be entirely carved from Bethesden marble. Using even relatively local marble seemed a bit excessive for what we had always understood to be a sort of builder's level, a practical but otherwise unimportant ornament. So on returning home, I googled string course. Here I found that such string courses are still part of the architectural language of Orthodox churches, where they symbolize the girdle of Christ that binds together a community of priests and believers. We reasoned that because the Catholic West and Orthodox East had been the same church until the great schism of the 11th century, this ornament must once have been a shared symbol. And indeed, we went on finding that these so-called string courses were anything but level. Instead, they snaked their way around windows, sedilia, and Easter sepulchres in almost every one of the 200 or so collegiate chancels we have surveyed. And in fact, they could be seen in other chancels too, where there is also evidence of numbers of singers and clerks. This suggests to us that these places were also collegiate in some less strict or perhaps simply undocumented sense. What should we now call these no longer humble symbolic stones? A girdle course or a binding course perhaps? By the latter part of 2013, we were benefiting, benefiting from the support of the society and able to spend more time in each place. This made it possible, among other activities, to persuade church wardens to take us into places they were sometimes hesitant to allow us to see, or even hadn't visited themselves. One striking example of this was on our second visit to Corston Church in Norfolk. We finally persuaded a very reluctant church warden to unlock a small building on the northeast side of the chancel. And this turned out, to our great surprise and joy, to be a perfect chantry chapel, complete with its painted ceiling, an altar pace, and the remains of frescoes. It does not figure at all, even in detailed books, about that famous church. On one of our return visits to Soak by Clare, we were able to visit the college buildings there, now a school, in company with their consulting architect. In those parts of the college house that are documented to have been rebuilt under the wardenship of Matthew Parker, we saw that the same kind of moulded oak beams with low leaf stop chamfers we had found in the vestry and other parts of the church. We think there is now no doubt that the east end of the church at Stoke by Clare was the college chapel, at least from the time that the church itself had been rebuilt to its present form in the late 15th century. 
It's just two minutes gentle walk from the college building. This nearness and the special ceiling beams and the position of the standing organ and its access were vital clues for understanding the real situation there. In investigating the architectural and musical archaeology at Stoke by Clare carefully on the spot produced a reinterpretation of the church building and the college. Now we will look rapidly at four case studies to see what new light can be shed on even some well-known buildings. For at least four 19th century architects, as well as some 20th century historians, the Collegiate Estate Church at Shottersbrook has been a model building. It was copied by Benjamin Ferry, written about by Butterfield and Mitchell, and restored by George Street, a fellow of the Society. However, not all its secrets have yet been revealed, we think. It was built in the 1330s with a dual purpose as both a very small estate church, that is the present nave with its font, and as a college and perpetual chantry for the soul of William Trussell. This double role makes the church in fact anything but a normal parish church. The collegiate part comprises the majority of the building, the transept chapels with the founders' tombs in the north, and the singing chancel and sanctuary. These have a pointed barrel roof structure which was originally sealed with plaster. There is also some later perpendicular work of uncertain date. The chancel itself is a fine example of original 14th century work, but there is one important alteration where the symmetry of its windows is broken on its north side. Its northeast window, that's on the extreme left, has been blocked up and a doorway pierced through the wall below it. If an external two-storey building was built here at the same time as the perpendicular alterations, perhaps around 1425 to 50, then this would have been created for the same reasons as the one at Stoke by Clare. Such an addition would be fully consistent with changes in musical practices, including an accelerating installation of organs that took place during the 15th century, together with a typical rapidly increasing acquisition of additional vestments, books and ornaments. One might think it strange that such a building could have disappeared so completely, but we'll now look at two places where this certainly did happen. The hunting hills of southeastern Leicestershire hide a remote but very fine and unexpectedly large collegiate chapel. Its definitive foundation also dates from the early 14th century, where a charter was drawn up by Roger Martival, descendant of the family that had held the manor since the conquest. He was Chancellor of Oxford University and later Bishop of Salisbury. As many prelates were to do during the following two centuries, he made plans for the salvation and education of his local folk. Architecturally, the chapel reached its ultimate form in the later 15th century, when it was remodelled with a new flat wooden ceiling and larger east and west windows. Nicholl's history of Leicestershire is always invaluable, but here it is crucial as a description of things no longer visible. A comparison with the view of the north side of the cha chapel now, with his 1792 engraving, will make this clear. This is what Nichols wrote. Between the tower and the chancel is a small room, separated from the tower by a pointed doorway, which is now and has long been walled up. Between this room and the chancel on the east side of the doorway is a piscina. In this room also opens a door, cased with plates of iron, now much corroded with rust, leading up the stone steps into the loft where the clock is encased. Adjoining to this loft or chamber is another loft over the small room first mentioned, and out of this chamber was a small circular window into the chancel, now walled up. Here then we have a documented example of a now missing two-storey building, though this time it's sandwiched between the north side of the chancel and a tower, also now gone. There are two significant clues as its original design purpose in Nichols' on-site testimony. The first is that the door to the stairway from the lower room, a sacristy with a piscina, is cased with plates of iron. This reinforcement indicates that up those steps there were precious things to protect. Second, what Nichols calls a small circular window into the chancel is still to be seen. It's not in line with, of sight with the altar, being placed just behind an arch brace of the roof, but it is a, on a potential sight line to the singers on the south opposite side of the choir. So a possible reason for the window might be that the person who raised the bellows of an organ 
placed in an upper room, just like at Stoke by Clare or Dennington, could see when the singers opposite stood up to sing. He could then put some wind into the organ so that the organ player could give them the note to start a canticle, hymn or psalm. If so, it's the analogue of similar windows, such as the one at Wingham College in Kent again, which also gave a view from the, the upper bellows room or loft to the opposite choir stalls below. The tower and the adjoining rooms at Knowsley were demolished earlier in the 19th century, and the whole church was scraped and tidied up as late as the 1890s. Without John Nicholls' estimable, thorough, and very antiquarian on-site investigations, the historical, musical, and archaeological value of this remarkable building would have been very seriously impoverished. The well-known Taurus Church at Stratford is another dual-purpose design, its college having been founded by John of Stratford in the 1330s, when he was Bishop of Winchester. He had been brought up in his name town and would have been a product of its already well-established town grammar school there. Thomas Balsall, Dean of the College, completely rebuilt the chancel from around 1491 to about 1521, the time of the compiling of the Eton Choir Book. His chancel is clearly designed to provide optimum conditions for the performance of complex polyphonic liturgical music. It's well lit by five sets of large windows, and like Knowsley, it has a flat bordered oak ceiling. The church building is a larger version of Shottersbrook in its layout, with the central tower and lateral transept chapels. And as at Shottersbrook, there is a blocked doorway on the north side of the chancel, although in this case, it's placed further down, just east of the medieval choir stalls. Almost over this doorway is the bust of William Shakespeare, who is buried nearby in the sanctuary. This privilege came about through his purchase of new place and its attendant rectorial rights. These had been acquired at the destruction of the college in 1547, of which his father was a witness. This elaborate doorway once led to a substantial building attached to the north of the chancel. As far as we could ascertain on the spot, it measured around 20 feet 6 inches wide by 20 feet, 25 feet long from north to south. The watercolour by Thomas Girton shows that it comprised three storeys, rising about 25 feet to the height of the chancel parapet. Here were the storerooms of the college, and properly the practice and schoolroom and the dormitory for the singing boys, whom the college charter ordained should sleep in the church. Once the college had, as usual, been despoiled, the lower part of this large building was turned into a charnel house. This explains the rather, otherwise rather curious admonition on Shakespeare's grave slab, which warns off anyone who might think of mixing his bones in the charnel house along with those of the hoi polloi. Constant reuse of graveyard space and the consequent digging up of bones reminds us of the conversation between Hamlet and the grave digger. Since this grave was unmarked, as all external graves were until the 1660s, Hamlet would not have known whose it was, so he was forced to ask, receiving, as we all know, the answer that it was Yorick's. If you look carefully at the slide, you might see him. This now lost building very probably housed the bellows of the organ too. And if so, the organ itself would have been on a gallery accessible directly from the choir stalls and roughly where Shakespeare's bust is now. The windows behind the bust now are not original, as you can see by comparing these photographs taken before and after alterations made after the death of William Morris. Was there, as at Knowsley, a small window somewhere in the now vanished solid walls behind Shakespeare's bust, placed so that the bellows raisers could see when a cantor on the extra seat in front of the southern choir stalls rose to sing? We will probably never know. Despite Morris's Society for the Preservation of protection of ancient buildings, having taken an interest in and trying to halt the vicar's rebuilding proposals. Much of the stonework inside and outside the north of the chancel has been very heavily reworked. On our mentioning to a knowledgeable friend that we were intending to survey Saul in Norfolk, he remarked, ah yes, that huge church with the hole in it. We didn't understand what he meant at first, but now I think we do. This church poses two major puzzles to which we're now going to suggest possible answers. First, why are there so many choir stalls in such a remote and rural place? We know that the church is large because it achieved its present form as the result of a building competition between six local landed families, including a branch of the Berlins. 
but there are as many choir stalls here as there are at Stratford-on-Avon. Also, most unusually for a parish church, there's an outside clerk's doorway on the north side of the chancel. There is a large area of land to the north of the church that is and always has been part of the curtilage of the church. Although possible crop marks in aerial photographs are not conclusive, we wonder if there were once collegiate buildings here. It would not be surprising if they are long gone, because later enclosures and boundary changes have led to the disappearance of all but a tiny handful of buildings around the church. However, establishing a Chantry College of Clerks and Priests would certainly have been a very attractive option for the wealthy local families. Such a college would need a northeastern building for storage accommodation of the sort that we saw was provided at Stratford and Knowsley, as well as entirely separate college housing. A geophysical ground survey here might unlock these enigmas. The second major puzzle at Saul is that there are no signs of at all of any stairway access to the loft over the screen that undoubtedly closed the choir at its western end. There's ample evidence for a large structure here. The curve of its eastern coving is still visible, high up on the north side of the chancel arch. There are two cut-off wooden upstands which rise above the screen's dado. Mortises at its extreme low ends suggest the possibility of a wooden structure which extended westwards from the screen. There are also large northern and southern lateral transept chapels funded by the same local manorial families. Altars here are likely to have been thought of as private, so their chapels would have been screened off all the way across their western edges, one bay down the present nave. A large wooden platform with its own staircase could have spanned the crossing to incorporate the western screens of these later, lateral chapels. Such a large structure would have been able to support not only an organ, which we know to have been somewhere in the building, but perhaps also the rude figures as shown with a doom above. The present pews certainly contain enough medieval parapet carving, there's actually about 72 feet of it, to go all the way round such a structure. An organ at Saul could have been placed either centrally to speak into the chancel, as at Newark and Dunster, or placed to one side, as in some contemporary Flemish churches. There is no room for a sizable organ anywhere in Saul's chancel. Such pulpits still exist at, for instance, Carlisle and Hexham, and we now think that there were similar large pulpit and like structures now entirely missing in quite a number of churches. The clue to their one-time presence is that there are no stone spiral staircases or other fixed access arrangements. The highly unusual access arrangements at Totnes remind us that there must have been various ways of reaching organ and choir or rood lofts in the past. Many other internal medieval furnishings, including organs, are missing, as we have seen. And we have surveyed many places where external buildings are also now missing, just as they are at Shottersbrook, Knowsley and Stratford. And we need to ask ourselves why they were built in the first place and are, under what circumstances they were abandoned. Current sustainability problems mean that the, more than ever we need to go well beyond just admiring empty medieval churches. If we have a deeper knowledge of them as busy places of daily work, we can imaginatively put working boys, clerks and priests back into these churches. Then we can understand much better how they were designed, how they were equipped, and why they needed to be adapted to accommodate liturgical, musical and social changes. Alterations have always been made to churches, but some present-day adaptations are deeply worrying from musical and archaeological points of view. The wisdom of the Venice Charter is in danger of being replaced by the, the ignorance exemplified in the recent repainting of the chancel at Chartres. Unfortunately, we have seen the results of similar ignorance in England too. Three books, the first of which is now well underway, will be the result of our initial research but there is much yet to be discovered by other researchers. It was Professor Peter Williams who started all this work in 2008 and supported us so strongly in carrying it out. Very sadly, he's no longer in this world to see its fruits. But he said and insisted that our work must be progenitive. We hope it will be. You'll find out much more about our work and our future lectures, some of them anyway, on our website. But especially we must say thank you all for helping us to embark on this very exciting adventure. Thank you.